Are you a fan of Deja Vu? You ever had one? Well, how about being able to be so lucky that you get to experience something twice? I think Deja Vu is pretty awesome. And I love about the Deja Vu is when we get to do it with a guest. This is an opportunity to hear from somebody who told an incredibly powerful story in the past. And if you're going to learn about how to scale a business, how to be good, fit it in, and how to actually find work-life balance when you're a CEO, when you're a founder, when you're a creator, and when you're a mom, how do you do this? This applies to all of us. This is Great Lessons. This is Liza Huber, the Disco Posse podcast, and it starts now. everybody welcome back thank you for watching thank you for listening i am loving that we get to bring amazing guests on and this is a return guest this is liza huber if you want to see more great stuff like this of course i got to make sure that we give a shout out there's lots of great supporters hit the links down below and in fact you can hit that subscribe button you can make sure that you let us know that you're watching drop a comment below if you are interested in seeing more stuff hit the little bell icon thank you it's an amazing thing to see the feedback that we get because people are loving the video aspect of the podcast. You're going to see a lot more of it, but let's just get right to it. This is Liza Huber. She's the founder of Sage Spoonfuls. She talks about doing and adjusting business in difficult times, about the work-life balance and how to fit it in and, and making sure that we're doing the right things that are in front of us, being present. And also we talk about social media for kids and, and her impact on the world, her choices that she and her family are making. This is a lot of fun. It's a really good, deep conversation. Always a pleasure to have Liza on, so check it out. This is Liza Huber of Sage Spoonfuls, and it's on right now. So, Liza, welcome back. That's always fun. I have my favorite thing when I get to say welcome back because in it's not often I get a chance to reconnect with amazing people. And, you know, uh, so when you're not purveying beautiful puppy love on Instagram and and driving back and forth doing what I can even, I can't even imagine the amount of hours and miles that you commit to powering the, the factory that creates all the sage spoonfuls goodness. You're busy. You're busy. <laughs> it's, it's been a time. Eric, thank you so much for having me back on your show. I really, our conversation was one of my favorites because, um, it's so nice to be able to connect with someone so like-minded who you can talk to about business for an hour and a half and you know you're not boring the person you're talking to. You know, it's it, it was such a great conversation. So I'm really looking forward to our chat today. And yes, I have logged the miles. Boston oh. to, you know, our New Jersey warehouse every single week uh, since the pandemic started. So it's um it's finally easing up for me, but it's it's been a a lot. <laughs> well, and it was, I tell you the time and trying to remember exactly when we recorded, but it would have been about this time last year. I think it was almost a year ago. that. We yes. It was about one week or two weeks before everything shut down. And yeah. what a difference uh, one or two weeks makes. Life comes at you fast it and sure then does. slow. Whole, it was such a, it's just been such a weird year. And, and I remembered we, we, we talked and we said, like, we should probably reconnect soon to get a sense of how it's going to go, you know, as restrictions come in and things can get a little weird for a little while. Yes, <laughs> that, a lot that longer while, than we all thought. Yeah. It was a long while, a long while. But, you know, so, it's so, it, it's amazing. I think we've all learned how resilient we can be and how we can just turn on a dime and pivot and do what we need to do. Um I mean, when it all happened, I had no choice. I mean, my assembly team couldn't go to work. The warehouse could stay open, but the assembly team. So I did it. I did it myself. I did it with my kids. I did it with college help. And as time was going on and on and on, I hired some people. I fired some people. I hired some people. I fired some yeah. people. You know, and now now our assembly team is back and uh, I learned so much. So I'm I'm grateful for the experience. And I guess for anybody who now they're going to hopefully go back and listen to it because it's a fantastic show and I really had a great conversation. Uh, let's reintroduce you and talk about 
where where you're at, where Sage Spoonful is and all this good stuff. So for folks that are brand new, because uh, that's the one thing I've I've learned too is that so many people will come back to me and they'll be like, "Hey, now that I've like caught the latest show, I'm going in the backlog, you know, I go into the catalog and I say, which one do you go?" And yours invariably is the one that I send them to. I'm like, "Oh, thank you, you so much." A really really great discussion that shows the breadth of what we can cover and not just be like, Hey, here's, you know, seven talking points about the business, but very much like really solid business lessons an incredible story. You know, your personal story that was really, really hit home with a lot of people. And I get a lot of comments from people about that. Oh, thank you. So, uh, you are the founder and CEO of Sage Spoonfuls. And, uh, that's probably been a lot of your focus this year. Uh, so let's let's talk about that real quick and, and reintroduce folks to to what Sage Spoonfuls is doing. Absolutely. Um, Sage Spoonfuls launched seven years ago. We are a complete and really fun line of mealtime essentials for babies, toddlers, and kids. Everything from baby food prep serving in storage to making toddler meals at home and on the go to making um, school lunches, you know, litterless and healthy and quick and easy for parents. We really just you know, when I started the company, there was nothing on the market, nothing. Um, we were really one of the pioneer brands in this homemade baby food movement, um, homemade baby food prep serving and storage products. And I just really wanted to make this process simple by giving parents and caregivers everything they needed from one brand, from, you know, soup to nuts, everything you need to feed your kids. And in these seven years, we're now in our eighth year, Sage Spoonfuls has just grown year over year over year. We're, we're um, consistently a top seller with Amazon. We're launching with Pottery Barn Kids in a few weeks, which is wow. so exciting for me because that's a place I decorated all of my baby's nurseries and just always really saw Sage Spoonfuls there. And so when they contacted me over the summer, it was just really such a dream come true. And Pitching to your dream account via Zoom during a pandemic is definitely <laughs> presents its challenges, but um, it worked out and we launched in just a few weeks. I'm very, very excited. And uh, it's been a really interesting road. Well, you know, one of the things that I really enjoy about the way you tell your story in what you do through Instagram and through other things is you're very very transparent and very open about your discussion. And and again, like I said, that's a, a thing that people often say about our, our chat was they're like, wow, you know, it's not often people will really share so openly, especially, you know, really, really challenging, it's challenging story, you know, and seeing you and like you said, like, how do you, not only are you doing this thing, you're like, I've got to pitch this, you know, this multinational, you know, huge <laughs> brand, it's my dream, but you don't just do it. You think to yourself, how do I show people how do they do it? And it was really, it was really interesting to me that you you took that experience and immediately shared it, the creating of the experience. And I think that's that's also again a sort of a rarity in people like that understanding the empathy of I'm not just going through this alone, but I'm going to share this craziness with with my world, and then hopefully you know, and you give like here's tips, this is how you set it up, make sure you get like like you know. I'm always wondering, like, how do you know, like, how this is going to be interesting to people? Because it is, it very much is. But, like, I just can't. I'm, I'm not a good Instagrammer. I'm, I'm very terrible at it. <laughs> but, Don't sell yourself <laughs> short. You just have to, you just have to post and and do it and not think about it so much. And that's kind of where I am at this point. I mean, with the Sage Spoonfuls Instagram. It's very easy for me because we're talking about nutrition and food and our products and how to make it easy. But with my personal Instagram, I I feel so discombobulated because, you know, you don't know, do I want to talk about being a mom or, you know, my new puppies or business or what do people want to hear about? You know, and and, and, and I, I think and you think and you think and you think too much and you think yourself right into not doing anything. Yeah. So um, I thought in the moment oh, well, this this actually could be an interesting tidbit of advice because I know for me, you know, 
in my head, what, what you think in your head, what other people are doing maybe sounds so fancy or so big because it's so important. But, you know, there's a picture of me in my kitchen, I think in the same sweatshirt I'm wearing yeah. right now, but just <laughs> kind of leaning over the counter, like pitching to a huge retailer. Like this is what it looks like. It doesn't have to be, you know, big boardrooms and big fancy, you know, office, like in pandemic times, this is how you do it. I mean, we are a brand that's been, we're an established brand, you know, I'm the CEO and founder and I'm here in my kitchen uh, in a sweatshirt and I've made my nice spread and I have my lights and yeah. this is how I do it, you know, and, and, and it worked out. So maybe it works out for you too. I think what I really like about being able to share those perspectives and be open about it is the, the I'll say the not commoditization, but just the accessibility of knowing that this is how this is working, right? There's, there really is a lower barrier. I mean, it's, it's hard for people to really get, you know, they go in and they see people on Instagram, you know, living their best timeline and they see stuff like that. And then you, get the what they called them like the struggle porn people which is like the gary v's and he's like and actually the funny thing is gary v is talking about hockey cards and drawing pictures of like pigs on a I, he's a strange strange man god bless him he's a hell of a businessman but the whole thing of like if you're not crying in 24 hours a day then you know you're 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 not gonna win and this is winners win because they grind and, and like there's people get really set back by that but the way that you show it and the way that more and more people are doing the like, like blogging is a, a key press away, you know, being on Instagram, sharing stuff that's insightful and helpful to you and yourself and to your peer group is a click away. Like the stuff is there. It, it is there. And I, you bring up a very good point. Really. It is about the comparison, you know, whether it's someone you, you admire, someone you don't admire, how are they doing it? Bigger company, smaller company, famous entrepreneur, new entrepreneur. I mean, as I get more and more experienced, I'm really approaching my journey as a businesswoman, my journey as an entrepreneur, the same way I approach being a mom. There are hundreds of ways to be a great mom, to be a great parent. And it's the same thing in business. There's not just one way. So just because someone I admire does something one way doesn't mean it's the be all end all. I can learn from it. I can um, absorb it, but I don't need to copy it. I can do my own thing. And a few weeks ago when we were presenting, we, it was me with the camera, yeah. you know, presenting to uh, a new international distributor, you know, I'm doing things and the way I'm conducting business with our international distributors is the is different than what is traditional. You know, I, I, I like working with people in my own way that feels right for me. And I'm seeing success with that uh, in this way. It's, it's working internationally has always been a pain point for me because I have been a little bit uncertain as to how to do it. And I finally just put all the noise away and I I said, you know what? Let me just trust my instinct. I know what I'm doing and I feel it should be done this way. And so I was able to rebuild a big business with one of our former distributors and really start and open some new channels using my own um, methodology and not doing what other people are doing because it wasn't working for me and it was clear it wasn't working because I wasn't seeing success. And now trusting my own instincts and using my own voice and, and really doing our own thing is working out. It's, it's hard to slow down to see that, right? It, especially because we get the comparatives, especially in business. It's, there's always the, there's always somebody who says, well, you are close to this, therefore you should map to their, their processes. And it's and hard to trust your own voice. We are all right. so full of self doubt that, I mean, I'm now in my eighth year and only now I'm like, you know what? I'm going to trust myself on this one because it's not been working out using someone else's mm -hmm. formula. It takes a long time for us to trust ourselves. At least that's my experience. And no, I, I, and I think again, it's the honesty of, of acknowledging that in ourselves that we, because, you know, even uh, looking at my current company that I'm at, you know, I watch as like folks that are from the founding team that begin to step away and do different things. And, you know, people that have been there for four years, all of a sudden they decide it's time to go. And and other people have been there for a long time and they're going to stay forever. Right. And and I, I've worked all these different companies and even just at like day to day work. 
it's hard for us to not look to, well, somebody else has been here for X long years and somebody else has used this method and it works for them and they're here. So therefore it must be the only way that it works. And to just suddenly find your footing and eight years is about right. You know, like it takes a long time. Uh, it's like a band. It takes about 10 years to become an overnight success. <laughs> it's true. I mean, I've heard that it, it really takes eight years to build a real true brand and not just a flash in the pan. And I see that. I'm feeling that now. You know, we're we're just now in our eighth year, and I really feel like Sage Spoonfuls has really taken a strong foothold in our category in juvenile products. And um, it's a good feeling, but it is a grind, and there is so much trial and error, and you just have to trust yourself and believe in your product and your own voice and your own journey and uh and know what's out there, but then put it away, put your blinders on and just zoom down your lane. Yeah. Well, it's even in a crowded marketplace too, it's important to understand that there's always differentiation. There's always an audience that you can capture that may not be already in that category already, or in that vendor's, you know, lane. It's, I mean, you know, right now we're using actually, I was to say, we're, we're using a platform that proves it. Well, I'm, I'm using actually a company called SignalWire. And, you know, I made a conscious choice to, because I love their platform and and they've been super helpful and interactive in developing it. And then, you know, look at, you know, Zoom is another alternative. No one would have said it was a good idea to come up with a video conferencing platform when there were three major players in the market that owned everything. Right. They but you believe in what you're doing and yeah. you do it. And if you believe in it, chances are you got a couple other people who will believe in it too. That's it. And your belief, you have to stick to that. And so eight years along the way, you know, what are some of the key moments you think that you, you felt like you didn't, you were doing the thing that wasn't your belief? You know, there's got to be a couple of moments, you know, we talked actually in the past, but you're, you know, going down the road with, with television as an alternative for, for advertising and some of the, the real challenges you felt with that. But what are some other spots that kind of stood out as, whoo, all right. I definitely, as soon as I said, stop it, I'm going to do my bloody thing. Uh, then you really felt you were hitting the, hitting it all in stride. Yeah. The, um, there are a couple. The first one that comes to mind is from way back in the day, right when we were launching, we were only about five months out of the gate and we thought we needed uh, some kind of sales rep group to get us in the door. And, you know, I came from a television background. I did not have a business background, so I was not exactly certain how to price our line. And I allowed these two gentlemen, these two sales reps, to really price the line. And they really lowballed a couple of the items. And to this day, one of the items with one of our largest retailers, it's still, they're refusing to adjust the pricing. And this is, oh, no. to, to, to a, and we're going to have to drop the item from the line because it just, it, it becomes un, unsustainable. But I remember when these two guys were pricing the line. And I remember saying like, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right to me. But of course I thought, well, they know more than I do, you know? Well, no, they didn't, you know, they knew some <laughs> things and we wound up, we wound up um, disassociating ourselves from them, you know, not, not too much um, further after that, but it, it took years to clean up their mistakes. And then I brought someone on um, who helped me price the line properly. Uh, and this person was with me for many, many years and she was incredible. And I learned so much from her, but also um, I gave, I put too much stock in her opinions right. and you don't need to have anyone else think that you have a good idea, but you, and once this woman transitioned out of, Sage Spoonfuls, I started to trust and find my voice as a business owner, as an entrepreneur. And I cannot even tell you how amazing it's been for the company. Sales-wise, I've brought on two new people who are incredible and you know they're listening to my ideas. I'm listening to their ideas. Um, it's a wonderful, even exchange of information and of ideas. Um, 
So I think that the biggest lesson I've learned when things go wrong is I wish I would have listened to my gut. Even if someone is more experienced than you, it doesn't always mean they're right. One of the things that I, I read in one of, that's a really good book I always recommend to people is called Principles by Ray Dalio. And, oh, I'm going to look and, into that. And he, they use a, a literally like heuristics and, and algorithms to kind of take human decisions and then try to represent them so that we can use it as a way to sort of validate. And so they said, like, let's create a machine that effectively makes decisions alongside us. And then once we validate our decisions into the system, then we can systematize those decisions and get rid of some of that stuff and get some of the uh, opinion out of the data. <laughs> and <laughs> But another thing you have to have, of course, is gut, right? That instinct has to be there. And they use something called an idea meritocracy, which is a challenging thing because you effectively have to say that, you know, this person that you had with you, you had no personal experience to say, I know better. So you look to them and you say they have succeeded or I, I'm assuming they've got some sort of history. You weight their opinion higher than yours naturally. And then now in living through it and understanding that you would have done things differently and you made choices that were successful, you've now given yourself that weight. You've given yourself this meritocracy of belief, but it's hard to do it, right? Hindsight is, is truly 2020 and it's, it's, but you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to get that earlier. I wish if I had a pill or a drop you could put on your tongue, that would make you just like, trust me yourself. <laughs> You're ready. Just take, go with your instinct on this stuff. It's so true. I think that that magic pill is just made up of years of experience. I don't yeah. think there's any way around it. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that's definitely where it comes in. And actually let's talk about years of years of life. I, I, what really triggered me as well to, to reach out again you, you you just had a birthday, so happy birthday again. Thank you. Uh, I guess you could say that regularly. It depends on when people listening. You know, who knows? It's it's a, it's a timely thing. But you wrote uh, about taking a, a real moment of like, like I'm going, I'm going hard, <laughs> and and you know, especially because we we have our kids growing up around us, and we see the changes, and we see the the things that we're trying to do with them. And all of a sudden you, you think I'm only going to get to do this once, you know, and it was a very, very insightful uh, thing that you wrote about this idea of, you know, maybe I need to figure out, am I balancing things right? So I'd love to hear where you are at right now with that kind of idea of, I think I need to make sure I'm prioritizing life. Yeah, I just turned 46. And I've always been someone who just never cared about the number. I mean, I, I feel full of life, and I'm in decent shape, and I can do the things I'm so I'm so grateful I have um, my health, and I can do the things I want to do. And the number has never bothered me. But something about turning 46 um, was like some invisible threshold. I didn't realize I was going to be crossing, <laughs> um, but it felt like this really tangible thing. And and I just kept thinking, why am I, why am I depressed on my birthday? Why am I feeling so down? And forty six is still young. It's not the. I don't know. It just. And then I thought, you know what? I feel like time is going by so fast because I am racing against myself every day. And I think that it's, for me personally, my relationship with time is really wrong. I say all the time and I hear people say all the time, oh, time is going so fast. Oh, time is going so fast. Like, like we know time is going so fast and maybe we should stop being surprised that time is going so fast and like realize why it's going so fast. And maybe it's because we've made life into this huge giant rat race. And all like for me, I work and I work, 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 work. And there are things I've been wanting to do with my kids and and it needs to be scheduled in because the day I die, I will have emails that won't, that will go unanswered. You know, it's just like, but in the, you have to live and slow and stop. So what I'm doing now is I'm getting up earlier. 
Um, and really just going through my day, I'm picking my five things that are critical for work, five things that are going to move the needle, not 50, five. And I schedule so that God willing, I can get them done by 3 p.m. when my kids are done with school. And then I am with them. I am out of the rat race from three o'clock until, you know, nine o'clock when they go to bed. So I can take my daughter to the barn so I can go to my son's lacrosse so we can, you know, do whatever. And then um, if I have a couple of things to catch up on before bed, fine. But I also want to give more time to my husband and I want my mind to be with my family and not inside my computer. And I feel like turning 46, for me, the main goal is to um, be where I am and be happy with where I am, be with my family and only be with them and not be thinking about emails. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the ability to be present is being present. That's really, really hard for people to do. And it's very easy to when you, so I'm lucky that I've been able to understand how to feel that I still struggle to reach it. But you know, when I go, when I go for a bike ride or go for a run, the moment that you are disconnected and forcibly disconnected. There's no way I can check my emails. No way I can check my texts. I can't do anything. And it is such a, just a beautiful clarity that you receive. And I guess that maybe some people call it mindfulness or meditation or whatever. I, I'm the worst. I can't meditate. Me neither. So I, <laughs> super stressful to me. I'm like, uh, as I'm sitting there going like, mm, I could be doing other things. <laughs> but when I go out of my way to, be present. It you just feel this trigger, and it's like this all of a sudden this moment, and it's like ah, oh, okay, good. And I've done it where I like just lose my phone in the house somewhere, and it's fantastic because there's no option because it's very easy, especially with that little thing, right? Just to like oh, I'm just let me just quick. There was an email that was coming through, and they reply because people reply all the time because they're That's also true. like me <laughs> and and work asynchronous hours and. But if you can force yourself to realize, then from there, it's kind of behavioral stuff that you can start to adjust. It's so true. And I have found that my anxiety level has decreased tremendously. Um, It's not gone because I think as a business owner and just as a person, like we live in (laughs) anxiety-ridden times and I still wake up at 5.30 every morning like, (gasps) but you know, what is this day going to throw at me? Oh God. You know, I tend to be a little negative too, which that's something I got to work on. But <laughs> I, I find that if I, I write down on my computer, just these five things. So when my mind starts to wander or when, you know, I feel like, oh, you know, the kids are going to get home from school. I should do more. I should do more. But no, I have my five critical things that I've done and the rest can wait. I'll pick five more critical things tomorrow because the emails are not as important as looking my, you know, kids in the eye as we're here and I'm cooking dinner and being really present here because the work is always going to be there. The kids are not. I mean, my oldest is 14. Like this, he's going to be out of the house. And I will be so sad if I don't change. Yeah, the it, I've got the interesting thing. I've got I've got four kids, and you know my oldest are you know out of the house, and you know, so my oldest son. He's. I suddenly realized the other day the sort of same thing of, like if I he's now I have no way to interact with him except on purpose. But when you're in the house with kids and family members and spouses and friends it's you feel that well they're all here so no one will mind if i just have a quick look at my email but when you suddenly realize like you have to go out of your way to interact with my dad and you know my oldest kids and stuff like that it's i i became again like you much more aware of it and the anxiety levels dropped precipitously when i got off of you know chasing whatever was happening at the moment you're so right. Just chasing, chasing and racing. And once we stop doing that, I mean, for me, it's been a big release of anxiety and, and, and more, a much more increase in a sense of peace and calm and happiness. Now the trick for this is always an interesting thing I look at is, is context is important when we make these decisions, right? Especially 
ways in which we interact with challenging and like just technology and business and people. If you now like take what you, how you feel now in this thing you've realized, do you think you actually could have done it six years ago? You are two years into Sage. It, is it? I'm always curious. Do you really think that? we kind of have to live through hard stuff to get to the point where we appreciate this now discovering ourselves again. I think so. I think absolutely. Um, and I really feel like it's in your forties where you've, your kids are getting a little bit older and you kind of come out of what I call the blur and you look up and 10 years has gone by and you've basically been in diapers and cribs and bottles and nap times and rushing and rushing and rushing and rushing. And you come out of the blur and you have to find yourself all over again because it's working kids and working kids and working kids. And you have to reconnect with your spouse and you reconnect with yourself and you reconnect with, with all aspects of your life. So I really think there's no way to preemptively just stay connected to yourself because it does take that experience of kind of getting lost in the blur. You get, you get clarity when you come out of it. Yeah. I've, I've, I've asked people all the time, listen, what would you tell, like, what, what would you tell, you know, 20 year old Liza and Liza, 20 year old Liza would probably be like, whatever. <laughs> I got this. You know, like I tell my, I think to myself at 20 years old or 19 or whatever age, even 25, I'd have been like, whatever, old man, I got this. Don't worry. <laughs> I would never have listened to myself. <laughs> oh, gosh. 20-year-old me was so wrapped up in being concerned with what other people thought. I was almost paralyzed. I would have I would have listened to the older version of me be like, really? Do you think? Like, I, I would <laughs> just, again, experience. I have chilled out so much over the past 20 or so years. Um I, probably having an older version of me give me any kind of advice would have probably thrown me into <laughs> such a, like <laughs> like a whirlwind of just not knowing what to do with myself. So like I would say to my 20 year old self, just do what you're doing because you're going to end up in a good spot. Just do as you do. <laughs> and I guess that also goes an important part of like being public. There's an interesting dichotomy of being very open but yet protecting yourself from being well well known by people that you maybe you wish you didn't weren't well known by right leading a public life and being involved in social media and sharing pictures of kids and dogs and stuff like this like it's a real interesting balance of being real but not being like i've literally had friends who like they'll post a picture like when she posted a picture of her dog and i was like really cute dog you need to crop it out because your the dog tag has your address on it. Like just like little I, weird things like that, that I'm acutely aware of. And, you know, even like I found, I, I got, you know, something I had sitting in my background and I literally had my address on an envelope and like, you, there's no way you can see it. But just for me, I was like flipping the envelope as I was talking to somebody <laughs> like just in case, because I'll, Though I have a very public life, I actually don't. <laughs> I don't certainly don't want stalkers, but I, I, what I put out there as public is what I want to be public. Exactly. Um, I think there's a a way to balance both, where you can share your thoughts and you know different pieces of your life, but it's but it's not everything, and the things that I share are not up for discussion. You know, I mean, it's not. I mean, I get some very, almost everyone is positive, which is really nice, but you yeah. do get people who are know-it-alls or who are jealous or who just don't have anything nice to say to anyone. And they'll, you know, send me some DM that's meant to be nasty. And the younger version of me might, might take a nasty comment seriously, you know, but the, the, the older, more experienced version of me you know, deletes the comment without giving it a second thought because you know where it's coming from and it just doesn't matter. So you, it's a mixture of having experience and keeping true private things private and learning how to, you know, brush it off your shoulders and um, 
but it's not for everyone. You know, some people show way more than I do and some yeah. people show way less than I do. And honestly, I still am uncertain exactly how I want to do this, you know, on Instagram. So I, I tread lightly um, with, with personal things. It's, uh, but there is definitely a beauty in, in being able to show that you're real and, and like, just because we, I mean, we're all real. And I feel like even saying it like, as if we get to like pretend we're, you know, but <laughs> For people to connect with you as a as a founder, as a brand, as somebody to trust, you know, we are, you know, that whole thing of like tweets are my own. No, no, they're not. Say something nasty and you'll find out if tweets are your own. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone writes that. I'm like, no, they are not. You, But being yourself really helps you to connect with people so that when they go and they work for a company or they represent a brand or you meet them on the street or, you know, then you really and genuinely, you kind of, you already have a bit of a relationship and a trust in them. Absolutely. You know, for me, the, the biggest personal share was sharing Brendan's, uh, my son, Brendan's story, um, about cerebral palsy and our journey with cerebral palsy. He's 12 now and we did not share our story publicly until he was seven. And I, I, that, that was a difficult decision to make for me. Do we share this? Do we not? And at the end of the day, I'm so glad we did because all of a sudden I had a, a light bulb kind of go off in my head. And I thought, you know, Every he knows something's different with the way he moves. Other people know something is different with the way he moves. No one treats him any any differently, but no one in our community knows exactly what's going on. And we never really talk about it with we well, at that time, this was many years ago, but we never talked so much with Brendan about it. And we certainly never spoke about it with our friends um, or or publicly at all. And the, the, the light bulb went off my head. Well, wait a second. I don't want him to think that we are keeping this a secret, like there's something to be ashamed of. Hold on a second. Right. Because he's seven and we've never said a word. Like there's got to be a way to share our story um, and how proud we are of him and how far he's come and frankly, how far we've come as parents and how much we've learned. And, and it, it was one of the best things we ever did because I've made so many friends in the cerebral palsy community who've really um, been life-changing people for me. And I, I, I would like to think that um, us sharing our journey with Brendan and the various surgeries and therapies and things has, has given to the community as well. Um, and I'm so glad we shared the story, but it definitely, um, you, you want to be smart about the way you do it, especially where your children are concerned. And I just wanted Brendan to know how proud we are of him. And I'm very proud of the way we shared the story at the time and of the way we continue to share the story. There's a, it's the, it's kind of retelling the story versus living the story in public uh, and being able to sort of have this time slider where like you knew where he was, you knew where you were in your own comfort, you knew where he was with his own comfort in himself and, and his surroundings and, and how he was going to, you know, interact with the world and how it would affect things. It was very good that you did that. And, and like you said, it's a tough one to even then, you know, to still say like, whoo, okay. You know, but I also, like you said, at some point, he's going to be like, "Why isn't anybody ever under like? Doesn't anybody know that you know I've I've got this this situation that that I have to deal with and some to my life? You know, it it is probably very proud for him to know that you waited, and then you told it in a, in a very mindful, respectful way. Absolutely, um, but also as a parent, you know, you don't because there are always people who have it worse off and better off. And yeah. you, it all, that colors your story too. And I always want to be careful, you know, 
you just tell your story because everyone has their own battles that they're fighting. And so you don't need to color your story down and you don't need to color your story up. You just tell your story. And as it is for you or as it is for your child or your spouse or your family, because no one should be there to judge your story. It just is your story. And there are so many more people than you could ever imagine living your same story as it is, or a similar story it doesn't need to be, you know, built up to be more severe than it is or, or, or talk down to be less severe. It just tell your story as it is. And you'll be so amazed at how many people can relate. Um, but you don't have to feel bad about sharing your struggles and just, you just tell your story as it is. The, an interesting thing as well. I, I'm curious if you think about as we go through, you know, we are of a generation that, you know, you've, you've led a, a life where like, you're, you're in television, you know, you've, you've, you're very public about what you do. I'm curious as you then bring your kids through to this, you know, they're the next generation, you know, when do you help them to decide how public they want to be or, or, you know, how to kind of coach them through that experience? Because now that they are growing up, they're going to be, you know, getting their own Instagram accounts and, and interacting with the world through different things. How do you prepare them and sort of coach them through from your, you know, family? And when you decided to, you know, be an, an open public figure, you know, how do you, how do you prep them for that one? I'm, I'm looking for help too. So I, I got my kids. I'm like, <laughs> we're well, all looking for help me, on this one. <laughs> you're asking me this question at just the right time, because like I said, our oldest is 14 and we're just now starting to have this conversation about, you know, wanting, wanting to get on social media because the majority of his friends are on social media, but he knows, you know, that I do a lot of social media for, for, a living really, um, and to promote the brand. And the other day, and I know so many parents have this issue, the kids are consuming so much YouTube and so much content. And I said to my son, you know, I said, you're sitting there for hours, hours consuming other people's content. How about going out and creating some of your own? And I know he wants to, but he's so busy and caught up in consuming other people's content that he's afraid to even get started. And I said, you know, let's just, let's ju just film some stuff. I know you want to put up stuff of you gaming. I know you want to put up stuff of you, you know, snowboarding. Like I edit video, like I do it every day. You know, I said, you have parents who, especially a mom who is an entrepreneur. I mean, I, I, I'm never going to poo poo any of your ideas unless it's like, you know, illegal. <laughs> so <Yeah>. just like <laughs> instead of sitting there and just consuming other people's content, create your own and let's get this started. If this is what you want to do, because I know it's what he wants to do, but he's, he's stuck in this, this tunnel of consuming other people's content. Every once in a while I bump into somebody and they try and tell them about, you know, like they see a, a story comes up in Forbes and you see like Ryan's toy review, you know, Ryan, who is the, top earning youtuber in history you know and he's i forget how old he is now now i've got young kids so of course i'm very familiar with ryan and ckn toys i could name all the channels in blippy and all these <laughs> and i i followed their story so i was curious like how do we actually how do they do this and how does the machine work and and it became just that of like as you study it like you just said it's I, I love it. It's just so easy the way you said it, you know, just create your own, right? Just there's nothing. The difference between Ryan and my kids is his parents took, you know, video of him early, you know, like, but they just did it regularly. And this isn't like, there's nothing out of reach for most people. It's, but it's, if you make a conscious choice, I'm going to create rather than consume pretty magical things happen. It's so true. Just getting started, just putting up that first video or that first post. I mean, without being overly critical of yourself, eight years in, when I look back now at my first set of product shots or food photography, I mean, it's horrible. It's <laughs> hilariously horrible, but you're not born an expert and we all have to start somewhere. And if you don't get started, you're never going to become an expert. So just start. Yeah. The, uh, I've, learn definitely in time that you get practice and, and, and it's, 
it gum- becomes easy. Like editing, video editing was one. I was like, I never want to get into video, which is why I never put video on this podcast. I'm like, I don't want to deal with it. What if it's like, you got to make sure that you got a camera. I'm even like tr- trying different camera types just to make sure. And you know, so I thought, hey, do I put this up? Because it's not perfect. It's a GoPro, not a true DSLR. And I'm, and I thought to myself, oh, just bloody do it. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Just bloody do it. Exactly. <laughs> And then as I test it and I'll try out different things and then it'll be, it'll be evolving. And then people be like, Hey, wow, the videos really come a long way. Okay, cool. And instead of me just, ah, I got to wait until I've got the perfect setup and I got to study how cameras work and I got to do it. It's like, no, just, just turn on the webcam and then. Yes. And you also need to see how people react to the content you're creating because for us um, product videos, it's the exact opposite of what you would think. Um, nobody cares about your slick video. Nobody cares about your <laughs> slick video. Nobody cares at all. You put in all this money, all this time, all this effort, but it's the grainy, like shaky, bad lighting cell phone video that you put up on your Insta stories that, you know, tens of thousands of people are like, oh my gosh, I love this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's people at least what I've found don't want to be, you know, marketed to with this slick messaging because I think they think that people, it's like an insult to your intelligence, you know, just like take a video on your camera and like put it up there of how this product works or who you are or whatever, like just do it. Let me see you in more of a, a raw, realistic form. So for us, I would have never, ever in a million years thought that these handheld cell phone videos are what people love. And I wish I would have known I wouldn't have spent so much money on our slick videos <laughs> back in the day. Yeah, well, it's, I think it is finding the right balance and finding the equilibrium of like super high production quality versus getting it out quickly. And, and I've got that. I've probably got like three or four things that I'm doing. Like I got to spend time editing and then I realize I'll, I'm going to sit on that to the point where I probably won't even put it out there. And I, that's why even in my podcast, like I, these are unedited and it, it kind of freaks people out sometimes to like, wow, I like, how do you, don't you want to edit out the ums and the hums and the ahs? I'm like, no, no, I want it to sound like two people actually had a conversation. And that's what we do. We say, um, sometimes we say, hmm, sometimes I say so too many times, whatever. <laughs> like, don't overthink it. Just do it's it. It's so true. Overthinking is just the death of everything. And, and I'm really working on not overthinking so much. Just just put it out there. Just put it out there. There's no perfect. People don't even want perfect. We strive for something that's unattainable that also that people don't even want. It's really ridiculous if you think yeah. about it. The other one that I, you know, related to kids and social media, the one morning I often do, especially with, you know, I've got a, uh, my, my oldest daughter, you know, she's 17 and, and I tell her, I'm like, Hey, well, she's a, she's a champion snowboarder. So like she's Amazing. eighth overall in Canada and snowboard freestyle. And so she's going to put herself up there. And I, I just tell her right out of the gate and like, don't read the comments. Like, no, you know, she ended up on an Instagram live with Justin Bieber. He was doing like, it's like random call-ins. And so she's like, why not? Let's give it a whirl. And she ended up on there and she immediately got like, you know, thousands of Instagram followers. And and I said, like, watch out, right? Because people are going to say stupid things. And you've got to make sure that you just, you just got to separate. Like, don't, don't read, you know, or if you do think about it, you know, about what the context was. I mean, of course, she's, I'm now the old guy giving the young girl idea, you know, advice that she's not going to take. But I told her, I'm like, don't, even when you take pictures of your life, you know, remember that not a tattoo it's not forever but don't make it so that you're putting so much stuff out there that you've got to call like i call it instagram bankruptcy every once in a while somebody be like in a relationship and all of a sudden they're taking like 200 pictures a day of themselves in this brand new relationship and then seven months later their instagram is empty and then they <laughs> and then That's they a good point they, yeah they reload it with pictures of dogs and cats and trees and <laughs> I'm like oh no maybe just balance how much you share with the world and you won't have to claim instagram bankruptcy that way you know you make a very good point about the comments and and people and making comments that are less than positive and something i said to my oldest son and the way i 
um, perceive comments and the way I deal with comments. You know, if you have a difference of opinion, that's one thing. And let's, you know, have a little back and forth about it. Let's have a, a difference of opinion. That's what makes us all different. And that's what makes the world go around. And I mean, if someone disagrees with me, that's fine. And let's talk about it. But if someone has something nasty to say, just for nasty's sake, I just block them immediately because they're not interested in having a conversation. They're interested in being nasty. And I have, I respect my time too much for that. Just boom, yeah. block, gone. And you should never give those kinds of people the time of day because when you're being nasty for nasty's sake, there's there's just something else going on. But a difference of opinion, um, that's something else entirely. Yeah, at the healthy, challenging dialogue. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but yeah, social media, probably not the venue to, to do it. But uh, yeah, I think we'll... I think there's really good stuff. Like there's the documentary recently that came out probably I think about a year ago now called The Social Dilemma. Uh, and very, very good talking about sort of the impact of social media and how the sort of machine works. And I tell people to watch it, not because I want them to get off of all social media, but I just want them to be mindful of what it's there for and to use it as a way to connect with people. And so I recently reopened a Facebook account because I need to do stuff for business things, right? Like I've got a podcast, I've got, you know, other, you know, little side hustles that are happening and I need to use Facebook ads. So now I'm suddenly back on Facebook, which I pretty much, I'd swore to people don't, I'll never go on Facebook again. Well, I'm so proud of you for getting your Instagram account because last year when we spoke, you didn't have an Instagram. I, I was like, Eric, yeah, you no, need to get an Instagram account. Uh, and I literally got like a text from a friend of mine. He's like, you okay? I think I saw you on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> like, but I good know. for you for kind of like going with the flow and realizing, well, maybe, maybe I should, you know, because there's a lot of benefit here. Um, and you can use it maybe in a different way than you used to, or that annoys you, you know, just, to, yeah. you know, you, these things are such powerful tools and um, you don't want to kind of limit your reach. So good for you for reopening your eyes to that. And to what you said before, it's this idea that I now, like, I will use it in a way that's meaningful to me now versus like 15 years ago or whatever, 10 years, whenever I originally had it. And I was just like, I'm disappointed in the way that me, my friends are behaving and I don't want to watch it. And that was <laughs> the primary reason, you know, like just watching the world just start to do weird things and having to watch it in real time. And so I said, well, my big area was Twitter. So I hung out on Twitter and, and I met a lot, I've got a lot of fantastic friends and that's how we interacted. And then, yeah, so I'm like, okay, I, I get, I got to get over myself and my Facebook problem. And, and so I got there so that I can use it very specifically to help reach people and to connect with people that are, I can have a meaningful connection with not to like see how many of my high school friends I can reconnect with and see where they're at. It's that, that, that may, you know, some people may come up that way, but I think when I first started, like most of us, we were on a race to friend counts and, and we kind of use, we misuse social media as like, that's why those platforms are created. Like that's the, why they, they go to school to learn how to manage behavior you know, they build products to specifically guide your behavior. And it works really good. It's a funny thing. It about does, <laughs> but you know, it's all new. I mean, remember when Insta stories first started? I mean, I, no one knew what to do with it. And what, yeah. what do you put up there? What do you use it for? And then you kind of find your way and you use it the way you need to, or you don't use it at all. And, and that's what social media is about. You use it in a way that works for you. I think so. We're, yeah, it's, we've learned and luckily we've been able to get lessons from people having lived it too, which is good. Now it's like everybody's on Clubhouse and, you know, <laughs> and that's going to be Twitter spaces and all this craziness. So, yeah, I, I think I might, I don't want to like clip my own wings, but I think I might stop at Instagram and <laughs> I don't, I think I, I, I'm on the verge of um, hiring someone to be like our TikTok content creator for Sage yeah. Spoofles because just like there's I'm only one person as far as content creation goes. So it's like and also you 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 can use these different avenues in different ways. I personally am never getting on Clubhouse. I, or at least I think I'm not. I mean 
how much time does a person have in their day? But TikTok <laughs> seems like a really cool platform. And I'm probably going to be looking for one to three content creators for, you know, Sage Spoonful's TikTok. And look, maybe as I get to learn more about Clubhouse, I'll be like a a late joiner. I, I don't know. But um, right now I don't get it. And I don't have any time to allot to it. And that's okay. It's, I, I always enjoy that every once in a while I try and think of myself like 20 years ago and to think to it in your own head of one day you're going to be saying the phrase, I'm looking to hire three TikTok content creators for my brands. <laughs> like this is a, if you can't look back and laugh on the, where the world <laughs> is with some of these things, it's, I, 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 I'm glad I can look and laugh at this stuff, but it, it's actually a fantastic opportunity that you can literally, you can do something where you can put, you can empower other people. You mm -hmm. can hi, you can enrich other people now to like help you help themselves. And they will then take that and become brand ambassadors and managers for another company or for, you know, again, as Sage grows. People That's, are doing some cool stuff on TikTok, like yeah. really, really cool. I mean, it's not me. I don't know what to do, but I, I can find some people who are great at it, <laughs> you know, and and and, and help use it uh, for a different generation of the brand. Um, I think it's really important that we keep our our eyes open and not yeah. say no to anything. As I sit here saying, I'm never getting on Clubhouse. So that's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be live on Clubhouse by the time this pub this pub is here. I'm sure. doing a fireside <laughs> chat any day now. <laughs> I. I I've I was one of those people that I was like, oh man, everybody's racing to try and get an invite to Clubhouse, and then I was like, yeah, do I really want to join that crowd? I I never want to be that that person, right? But I ended up, uh, I got an invite and like, You're okay, very let's, cool. Let's You're just sit in, in on it. <laughs> I get it. Oh, and I tell you, that's part of what bothers me about this whole thing as well is this real the the scarcity and exclusivity which is what makes it you know valuable you know because people want in but they can't get in you have to get invited it's a whole scene and that's what really kind of bothers me about the the social ladder that's being created and and I know why they do it like I I I know behavioral psychology and I know business those two things come together beautifully and you know that was the method so what I got on and I listened it's, it's neat it's a neat platform but I'm trying to figure out how to how I would use it effectively. You know, I've sat in for some discussions and it's neat, but they're, you know, I haven't found a reason why I would need to be there a lot yet. <laughs> uh, and then Twitter space is basically the same thing. It's just for Twitter, but um, you know, we'll see, we'll see. I think as our kids test us on what they think, like, Hey mom, you know, I got this great idea. I opened up a zap zap account or whatever's going to be next. There's things and I, I can't even, I can't even um, think right now, the names of these things that my 14 year old is telling me, Oh, I was blah, blah, and blah, blah. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm now that parent that like has no clue, you know, but I, I, I don't want to be the parent who's like, <sighs> I want to be like, Oh, tell me, I want to, I, I want to know, like, I'm yeah. never going to get on like the same plat, or at least I can't imagine I would be on the same platform a 14 year old is on, but I want to hear and I want to stay open because I don't want him to be like, Oh, my mom wouldn't understand. My mom is so old or whatever. <laughs> like, <laughs> I may not have any clue what he's talking about, but I also want to know what the heck he's posting and on where yeah. 14 is a little precarious. Yeah, that's it. And that, that's always the, the interesting thing, but the, just the fact that you can have a discussion and have him be proud enough to say, Hey, you know, look at this, I'm doing this thing. It's your, he's already introduced critical thinking, right? Like I'm, I'm not hiding this. I'm not going to like, wait till I know it's worth sharing. He's like, Oh yeah, this is really cool. Check this out. And the fact that there, we can create that ability for our kids to want to share and interact and, and that they trust you, you know, to like, Hey, you may find this pretty neat. You know, it's a, that's a pretty good feeling. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And you know this having um, older kids as well and, and teenage, you know, going through the teenage years as I'm really starting to get into, into the meat of the teenage years, yeah. um, really thinking a lot about social media and the kind of parent to a teenager I want to be. And I've come to the conclusion that when this child gets in trouble and he's out in the world, I want him to say, oh my God, I'm in so much trouble. 
I need to call my mom versus, oh my God, I'm in so much trouble. My mom is going to kill me. Right. You know, I, I, I want, I want to instill standards of behavior and, 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 you know, instill, you know, some elegance into him and, and, and rules and things like that, but not so much to the point where he's not going to share every, you know, as much as possible with me, if things go wrong or before he shares things to social media, I want him to say, this is cool. Or I'm not sure I'm in trouble or, Oh gosh, I don't know. Let me show my mom. <laughs> that's, <Yeah. laughs> that's what I'm going for. So we'll see how it works out. <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's the best thing you can do. And, you know, I've, I've, tell everybody, you know, friends, family, you know, that, that very thing. Like, look, I'd much rather you come and tell me something horrible than you lie to me about something horrible. And then I find out about it, you know, cause then it's really horrible, you know, and that doesn't even need to be horrible. Just like if you need help, you know, ask for help. Don't wait till you're beyond help. And, and that's right. especially with kids that like, look, they're going to have experiences that we all did, you know, I'm, I'm glad in a way that they're a little bit more tame than they were when I was a kid. <laughs> and there wasn't yeah. a camera everywhere. Like anything yeah. you do, like God bless these kids. I mean, we all, we got to make our mistakes just in a closed circle of friends. I mean, could you imagine, like, I, I mean, I think about the stupid things I did as a teenager and in college, if those things are posted, I mean, this is the world that they all live in now. And I try to really instill that into my, my, my older kids, like, look at this one thing, this one person did at two in the morning and a, and a neighbor filmed it from across the street. And now his career is over or yeah. her, she did this or he did that. And, you know, and the, there's no privacy. If you're out in a public place, people can film you and post it. And that's unfortunate. There's no room to make the mistakes. Like, like we made mistakes. Um, you have to be so very, very careful. Yeah. Your sphere of, of influence was smaller, but so was the sphere of effect in that's a the, great way to put it. Yeah. I'm 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 hopeful by what I think we are learning. Like you said, you know, this stuff is new and now it's not new, you know. So mm -hmm. just in the way that, you know, you're eight years into business, now stuff makes sense and it's becoming obvious, you know, or comfortable and that you can make decisions more aggressively and understand that you're going to get through it. And, and life is like that. You so know, true. We've we're this many years in and we're like, okay, I can experiment a bit. <laughs> so true. The irony is that by the time w when we start to have our mind form is like, we, I need like this level of experience and comfort at the point when I was ready to, like, I could have taken on the world, you know, <laughs> we can still take on the world. That's it. I tell my friend, I said, I, I hope that there's a 70 under 70, uh, you know, con uh, thing, because I totally missed all the other 20 under 20, 30 under thirties and 40 under 40. So, and I, I'm not too far from the 50 under 50, sadly. So, uh, I'm, I mean, even higher, but uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. But, you know, that goes back to like what we were talking about for my birthday. It's like the rat race. You have to be something, do something, go somewhere, achieve something by a certain age. Like no one cares but you. It's this self-imposed deadline and self-imposed. Oh, my gosh. One of my puppies just almost knocked over the light. I'm so glad <laughs> they didn't. But the other one might. <laughs> um but yeah, just having our own personal timelines. And I mean, okay, I'm 46. It doesn't mean I. There, there's no, it's not over. <laughs> you know, we have we have all the time in the world and we just keep going and we may not have all the time in the world, but we can't turn back time. And I'm such a different, more equipped person at 46 to do the things I want to do than I was when I was 25. Yeah. Don't knock over this light. <laughs> Hold, on. <laughs> Hold on. Don't knock over the light. Oh, girls. No, there's nothing better than like this is we were talking at the start about like this is the fun of like the 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 honesty of of our lives in quarantine yeah. and it's like you know, we're surrounded by kids and puppies and, and craziness. <laughs> ha, ha, this is this is Vista. This is where Hi, the folks Vista. need to come on. This is why I love having the video on the podcast. So people are definitely got to watch this one. Look at that. She's, she's already she's huge. She's <laughs> huge and she's only 14 weeks old. She's like, what are you doing? Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. Just but don't knock down the thing there, girlfriend. One of my one of my favorite things, and I realize I, I'm I'm totally stealing into our extra time here. Uh, but 
I, a story I read recently, and it was really impactful. And you talk about timelines and this race that we're on. You think like, what's the race that we're in? And who are we really racing against? Exactly. Exactly. And there was a, a fellow, his name is Adeo Rossi. And I think that was his name. I, I probably mispronounce it, but, and he was actually going to, uh, so Dr. Jordan Peterson, who's uh, a sort of famous Canadian uh, behavioral psychologist, famous for reasons probably he doesn't want to be famous for, but at any rate, uh, had, was a therapist for this fellow. And he says, Hey, look, I've, I'm really struggling. You know, I've created this, the founders, uh, initiative and created all these, you know, successful companies and done all these things. And he says, and I don't feel like I compare. You oh. know? And, and he says, well, who do you compare yourself against? He says, like my college roommate has been so wildly successful. And I, I kind of use that as my bar to set. And he says, who is your college roommate? Uh, Elon Musk. <laughs> like, well, and perhaps you shouldn't set your bar quite that high. <laughs> that's a tough. That's that's a tough one. <laughs> that's a tough one. But I I like this. Be be on your own timeline. Yeah. Don't take in the content. Create it. And be present. Absolutely. Some pretty solid lessons. Write those down. I feel good. I feel good. Well, thank you, Liza. This is really cool. And, Eric, thank uh, you so very much for having me on again. I always love speaking with you. I think we'll have a lot of good stuff coming up, of course, for folks. Definitely check out Sage Boonfuls, uh, consumer of the products myself. So very happy uh, and and very, very cool. Um, and yeah, you're just your story and, and sharing it is really good. And a great follow on Instagram as well. So, uh, you know, please do check it out. And I look forward to chatting again, hopefully. Maybe one day we'll have an in-person podcast. Uh, that, that'll be the, the day when the doors open again. And that would be great. I would love it. It feels like we're, feels like we're on at, a, at least at a turning point now where people are feeling a bit more comfortable at what, what's ahead, which is a, a good feeling. I think so too. Talk about racing on a timeline. You know, I think a lot of the last year really taught us to think hard about how we spend our days and our hours and uh you know spend it well spend it well and this was this is my hour well spent for sure thank you very much thank you eric